Champlain College in Burlington, Vermont. It evolved from a two-year business program downtown to a four-year institution on the hill. It went from a handful of students learning to be bookkeepers to 2,400 students preparing for a wide array of professional careers. How did it happen? The history of Champlain has its highs and lows. This is the story of Champlain, a school once known as the Invisible College. Champlain College was founded in 1878 under the name Burlington Collegiate Institute and Commercial College, later shortened to Burlington Business College. It started out as a two-year school for young adults to start a career in business. And what we saw was, was in that latter part of the 19th century, a, a big jump in the number of bookkeepers. Between 1800, uh, 1880 and 1900, a lot of, there were all of a sudden a lot of stenographers. And those, I'd say, in the business sector were the biggest uh, dr draws coming in. Secretaries, obviously, of all kinds. As Burlington grew at the turn of the century, the young college did well. We think that Champlain College started out very small, with as few as six students in its opening year in 1878. Um, and then grew gradually over time. So by the 19-teens and 1920s, there were about 100 students total, about 50 students in each class. During those years, the school rented several locations in Burlington's downtown district. In 1941, World War II changed the nation. The draft kept many young men out of college. Even after the war, the school struggled to recover its enrollment numbers, while Burlington struggled economically. It was, it was very tough, like Bell Aircraft that uh, had been making these uh, airplane parts, right? Uh, they pulled it out of town. That company that was making these uh, packs for parachutes, they pulled out. Uh, Things were very tough in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Probably the worst thing economically that happened to Burlington in 1954, the woolen mills in Winooski shut down. And that was disastrous because they were, at the, by that point, they were the largest private employer in, in Burlington. After the Second World War ended, the GI Bill gets introduced in the United States. So veterans returning from the war, many of them now have the opportunity to go to a four-year college institution where they didn't have that opportunity in the past. So Champlain College suddenly has a lot more competition. Then came a crisis in leadership. In the mid-1950s, the college's owner, A. Gordon Tittimore, had fallen ill. He planned to close the college's doors after spring semester 1956. He really saw the college through during the Great Depression and during the Second World War. So by the mid-1950s, when he's nearing retirement, he's faced with a school that has dwindling enrollment and is ailing financially. And he's also in poor health. So I think those factors put together made him less likely to look for a buyer for the college and more likely to think about just closing do its doors. Enter Clarence Bader Brulette, a successful businessman from Hartford, Connecticut, who moved to Burlington in 1955. Brulette was a member of the local Rotary Club where he met Tittimore. When Brulette heard the school was going to close, he offered to buy it. Soon after, Brulette learned that Albert Jensen, a local insurance agent, had been eyeing the college for a while and had plans of his own to buy it. He met Bader Brulette because he sponsored him to become a member of a local uh, branch of the Shiners. Brulette decided at that point to ask Jensen to join him as a partner, thinking that he could use someone who was rooted in the community, who had been here for a long time, to help him uh, increase student enrollment and manage the college going forward. The first task was to spruce up the space on Main Street in the building now home to Nectar's Restaurant. Brulette and Jensen renamed the school Champlain College of Commerce. Later, it was shortened to simply Champlain College. It was a small, pretty small space. They had one large classroom slash study hall and then another smaller classroom space. Pretty traditional classroom set up with a series of desks that were facing uh, a teacher in the front of the room and blackboards on the walls. 
Albert Jensen died in December 1956 after suffering two heart attacks that year. This left Brulette to head up the college on his own. Despite the loss, enrollment grew over the next few years and the college quickly ran out of space. Brulette sought a new home for the institution. He decided on the Hill section of Burlington. The first building that Champlain College acquired here in the Hill section was Freeman Hall, which was built in 1903 actually as a carriage barn. Bader Brulette jumped on the chance and moved the entire college up the hill to Freeman, um, which at that point had two floors and a basement level, and it housed the entire operation. The college was now growing in enrollment very quickly. To keep the momentum, Brulette knew he had to innovate. His goal was to combine the specialized education of a technical school with the worldview of a liberal arts college. That blend, he thought, would better prepare students for business careers. I think uh, the administration and our professors at the college have to always be in tune with what's happening, happening out there in the marketplace. And if you're not, then you are going to be like those colleges that unfortunately had to close down. And, and there's been two in the greater Burlington area. Brulette made the decision to expand the campus by acquiring Victorian homes on Willard and Maple Streets. The result was a campus that blended into the community. Vermont author Ralph Nading Hill called it the Invisible College. We were so different from the university, uh, from a university setting um, of concrete, square, no character. We had such character in our buildings. I lived in Lyman Hall. Uh, we just, we loved it. It was a hidden campus. Our signage was such that you, lots of times you couldn't even see the signage. So you didn't even know you were in the Champlain in a college setting. For many years that even people in greater Burlington area didn't even know where Champlain was. Regardless, the college continued adding programs and buildings even after Brulette retired in 1977. His successors built on that vision and took the college down the path he laid out. But for many of those years, neighbors of the college were not always happy. The acquisition of buildings in this quiet, affluent section of Burlington had some worried. They didn't want to see their community taken over. Tensions came to a high when Champlain decided to construct more academic buildings in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Neighbors, if they want to, really have the power to if not completely stop you, make, make it very, very difficult. And so when I arrived in 2005, every building that Champlain had done for a decade had been very contentious. For the most part, they all ended up in state environmental court. And in every case, the court ruled in Champlain's favor, but it was always a two or three year process and cost a lot, cost the college a lot in terms of uh, legal fees. Not to mention just, you know, time, time wasted. But there was a need for more academic space and a need for a new approach. In 2006, we, uh, we set about creating a campus master plan and we involved literally uh, hundreds of neighbors in, in creating that plan. We talked about what we wanted to do in making the, making the campus much more residential and um, we asked neighbors for their input. And so now it's been, uh, I don't know, probably close to 10 years where uh, the college has had no challenges, no legal challenges from neighbors. But it is like any relationship, it's something that requires constant attention and you know, the people at the college need to be open to and continue to communicate with the neighbors. The campus had changed a lot since its move to the Hill in 1958. It went from being just one former carriage barn to include residence halls, an auditorium, a library, and multiple academic buildings. But perhaps the biggest change from the Brulette years was the introduction of four-year programs in 1992. At first, the reason was economic. Newly created Community College of Vermont posed a challenge. President Skiff uh, and the board at the time then um, saw the community college as a, a threat to Champlain's ability to maintain enrollments. And so uh, they decided the best way forward would be 
to begin to sort of slowly offer uh, a number of baccalaureate degrees. And they began in, uh, in uh, business and then a little bit later accounting and, and it sort of grew from there. By the time I arrived in 2005, virtually uh, every program had, uh, had a, a baccalaureate component to it. I think Champlain's secret sauce since 1878 has been our connection to the business community and to nonprofit organizations. We've always been asking, what do those companies need to be successful? And today, what we are hearing is they want students who graduate as skilled practitioners, effective professionals, and engaged global citizens. This is why Champlain has been able to go from a small school renting a couple rooms in downtown Burlington to a four-year institution with a reputation for producing high-quality graduates. Arguably, Champlain finds itself in a similar place from the year it was founded, searching for ways to be relevant in a changing marketplace and giving students critical thinking tools and professional skills to succeed. When I arrived at Champlain, I interviewed almost 100 faculty, staff, and students um, about what they thought about Champlain and what they loved about Champlain. And one of the themes that came from that is that we're nimble, we're entrepreneurial, uh, we react very positively to changes in the market. And if you think about the higher education field as a market, it is incredibly competitive these days. And I spend a lot of time thinking about how Champlain is positioned in that marketplace so that we can continue to thrive. Champlain's history, a span from the 19th century to the 21st, is a mix of early success, economic hardship, and constant innovation. The invisible college on the hill is anything but invisible, an evolving institution with a vision for the future.